Well, good morning and, and welcome uh, to this uh, next installment of our uh, summer worship series, Christian. We're getting toward the end of that series. Um, I'm excited about the message that I have to share with you today as we uh, keep working our way through Scripture and, and uh, learning how Jesus teaches us to love others um, as followers of His. And uh, I want to take just a moment, though, and um, pray before we get into this time. So would you join me right now, and let's ask God's blessing on this time together. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you so much for this day, and thank you uh, for this opportunity we have once again to get into your word. I thank you for this summer series we've been in, Christian, where we can learn what that word means, what it doesn't mean, and, and uh, what followers of yours were called by Jesus, disciple. And thank you for helping us to grow in this area of our lives and to learn more what we're supposed to be like as disciples or followers of Jesus. And so thank you for this time we have in your word today to just bless this time, Lord God. Open our hearts and minds to receive whatever you have for us today and speak through me and please don't let me get in the way, but let us all hear from you today. We pray for those kind of blessings today in Jesus' name, amen. Folks, if you've been with us uh, uh, for a while, you know that we are closing in on this uh, uh, late summer series called Christian. Uh, one more message uh, to go after this Sunday, and that will take place on Labor Day. And so that's Labor Day weekend is when I will finish up this series. Uh, but today's message, if you haven't uh, caught it as of yet, uh, but if you look in your bulletins, this is what it says it's about. It's entitled Loopholes. And why in the world are we talking about loopholes? Well, because I thought we should talk about loopholes today. It's one of those things that Christians are rather fond of. And we've been talking about the difference between Christians and disciples. But Christians are rather fond of loopholes. And so we're going to get into that today. Um, you know what a loophole is, don't you? Does everybody know what a loophole is? A loophole is basically this. It's a way in, or finding a way of getting around a rule or a law so that you can get what you want. So it's a rather self-centered thing when we're looking for loopholes. It's rather a self-centered uh, type of thing. And, and, I, and I think this comes naturally to all of us um, if we're human beings because I see this phenomena all over the place. And it begins when we're young, times when we're young. So let, let me tell you, it's kind of like those conversations you had with your parents. Uh, some of you may, it may be a stretch a little bit to remember when you were teenagers, but all of us were teenagers once. And we had these conversations with our parents, you know, when your, your mom or your dad were upset with you because they thought you had, had uh, lied to them or done something bad, and the conversation goes something like this, oh, wait, 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 mom, um, you asked me if their parents were going to be home. And I knew that eventually they would be. And, and so when, when I said, yes, their parents are going to be home, I meant eventually they'd be home. You didn't ask me specifically if they were going to be home during the party that we were having at their house. And so technically, I didn't lie. Do you guys remember those kind of conversations with our parents? I think all of us have probably been there. But if you remember those days, folks, we love loopholes. Teenagers love loopholes. Uh, we learn those kind of things very, very young, and it starts when we're young. So folks, the reason I bring up loopholes today, though, in particular, and during this series, is this. And this is number one today, but Christians love loopholes. Christians love loopholes. I mean, if you're here and you're a Christian, I know you love, love, love loopholes. That's just the way it is. Matter of fact, all religious people, let me just say it this way, all religious people, regardless of faith, love loopholes. I'll never forget one of the first trips I took over to the Holy Land, uh, uh, to Israel, and, and we had a bus driver by the name of Marwan. And uh, Marwan was, uh, was an excellent bus driver, and, and uh, you could talk to him about his faith and so forth, too. He was a Muslim man, and this was in 1996. It was the last trip where my, my mother went along, too, and she and Marwan became good friends. But Marwan was one of those people we could talk to. And our trip in January over to the Holy Land overlapped with the Islamic month of Ramadan. And if you know anything about Ramadan, according to their prophet Muhammad, if they fasted during this month, as prescribed in their holy book called the Quran, 
then they would have their past sins forgiven. And so generally speaking, all Muslims fasted during the day, during the daylight hours, during the month uh, of Ramadan as prescribed by their holy book, uh, the Quran. And this is one of the main pillars of Islam. And here are the essentials, by the way, of the fast. Here's kind of the rules, the guidelines for this fast during Ramadan. Number one, your intention must be to fast from dusk till dawn, every day of Ramadan. And number two guideline is this, you must abstain from acts that would nullify the fast, that would get in the way of the fast. So if you maintain these two essential elements during your fast, your fast is going to be valid and it's going to be accepted. Well, let me tell you what it looked like um, from, what, from my point of view and, and from watching Marwan uh, during this time. Marwan and, and many others, I have to tell you this, would spend their whole day during this month of Ramadan instead of concentrating on their sin and forgiveness, which is what their holy book asked them to do, they would spend their whole day bagging up whatever they were going to devour after sunset. And that means food, that means cigarettes, whatever they craved, that's what they spent their time bagging up. Well, most of the time, as I observed this, um, Marwan would start eating and or smoking before the actual sunset in Israel. And and I found that was really interesting. And so in a very nice way, very kind way, I asked Marwan about this. Why why would you, if this is from dusk till dawn, or from dawn till dusk, I'm sorry, why would you start eating before the sun goes down? And his answer was this. Well, he said, the sun's already down in Mecca, which is over east in, in Saudi Arabia, and the birthplace, of course, of their prophet Muhammad. In other words, he was hungry. He was starving for a cigarette, too, and he'd found a loophole. The sun was down in Mecca, so that's all that counted. Folks, we all love loopholes, don't we? But Christians are especially fond of loopholes. Let me give you a few examples from our tradition. If you've been connected, for instance, uh, with the Catholic Church in any way, There's a great loophole in that particular uh, tradition of the faith called confession. You just sin and sin and sin some more, and then you go and dump it all on the priest, and there you go, all is well. So that's kind of a loophole for Catholics. It's called confession. But let's not leave the Protestants out of this, because we have our own loopholes. And one of those is found in Scripture in 1 John 1, 9. And this scripture has been um, abused in this way over the years. But here's what it says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's our license to fill up our sin bucket. We just go home, we get on our knees, we say I'm sorry, and then we go right back to whatever it was we were doing, filling up our sin bucket again. But it's an ingenious loophole that's been used for years, and us Protestants are guilty of that one. And then there are other Christians who have great loopholes too. They run into something that they don't want to do in life, for instance, and they just say something like this, well, we don't believe Jesus actually said that, or we don't believe those were actually Paul's writings. We think this is a result of maybe a mistake of years and years of oral tradition, and so we disregard that one. How convenient. But again, we all love loopholes, don't we? You see, Christians ask questions like this. How close can I get to sin without actually sinning? And I think maybe we've all been there at some point or other. Or how bad can I be and still get away with it? There's the bottom line. But Jesus' followers, disciples, is who I'm talking about. Ask a different set of questions, and and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But first, however, I want you to know this. Folks, we're not alone. If we love loopholes, if that's something we've loved in the past, we're not alone when it comes to loopholes. Here's number two. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were loophole experts. 
The religious leaders of Jesus' day were loophole experts. Folks, Jesus ran into this all the time. Religious leaders had taken the good law and they'd reduced it into a system that worked for them or that was convenient for them. The Pharisees in particular, that particular religious group, uh, were so in love with the commands that they actually forgot the intent of the commander. And so they loved the commands but didn't think much of the commander. They were so into this, they had rules, folks, to keep people from breaking other rules. And we do that as well. Let me see if I can show you that this morning. Um, I can still remember what it was like as a teenager. I keep going back to the teen years, but those are great examples. But I, I remember what it was like to sit in the living room of the home or the basement family room with your arm around your girlfriend. And then you decide for some reason, you're you know, junior high, high school, whatever, that it'd be a good idea to turn off the lights. And as a parent, you know, of course, that just means trouble. And so you shut off the lights and in runs your mom. I mean, mama comes in and she begins saying things like this. Whoa, she says, you can't turn off the lights. We have a rule. Thou shalt not turn off the lights. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We turn off the lights in this house all the time. As a matter of fact, mom, you're always telling us, turn off the lights, turn off the lights, turn off the lights. And now you're saying, don't turn off the lights. Would you please make up your mind? So you see, parents have rules too, don't they? They have rules to keep us from breaking other rules. They didn't want their kids messing around or getting into trouble. So if the lights are kept on, that shouldn't happen. It's a rule to keep us from breaking other rules. But the issue, folks, wasn't the lights. The issue was messing around, so they have a rule to keep you from breaking rules that will actually hurt you. Well, when Jesus showed up, when Jesus showed up, they had hundreds of these kind of rules. It got really confusing, and and, and over time it got so confusing that it was hard to tell which were the original rules or the original laws that God gave Moses and which rules they made up to keep others from breaking the rules. Jesus' response to this, folks, should frighten us. It should scare us to at least take a look at our whole approach to Christianity, and especially when it comes to this thing called loopholes. Here's what happens. Let me get into the scripture for today. This is from Matthew chapter 15. We'll begin with the first verse. Here's what it says. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked, they asked this question, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders. Now, the tradition of the elders was this body of laws that they had made up, created long after Moses, that supposedly kept people from breaking the law that Moses would have received from God. So the Pharisees were telling Jesus, you know, your disciples don't keep the tradition of the elders, not not Moses' law, but the tradition of the elders that we created over time to keep people from breaking Moses' law. Let me go on. Here's what it says. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And I know what some of you parents of young children are thinking. You're thinking, I didn't know that was in the Bible. This is great. I can pass that on to my kids. But folks, before anybody gets excited about this being in the Bible and says, this is awesome. I didn't even know that was in there. I just want to say it's not really that kind of hand washing. That's not what they're talking about here. Initially, the priests and only the priests were required to do these kind of ceremonial washings that that would cover the hands and all the way up to the elbow so that they'd be ceremonially pure. But as time went by, the Pharisees began to demand this hand washing of everybody. And so all Jews would have to do these hand washings before going to worship. It's a part of the tradition of the elders, though, not Moses' law. And so Jesus pretty much ignores their question, and he says this. He says, you know what? I got a better one for you. I got a better one for you. What about this? And and in verse 3, Jesus replies, and he says this. And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And of course, he turns it around on them. And they're like, what are you talking about? We don't know what you're talking about. 
Verse 4, Jesus goes on. He says, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. Folks, aren't you glad that we've abandoned those laws and got rid of those laws? Because if we hadn't, none of us would be here if it meant death every time we'd go against or come against our parents, which means none of our kids would be here either. But, but think about it. All of us have been angry at our parents before, and we've probably spoken out against them. And so Jesus just throws this question right back at him and, and basically says this, you're upset with me? for breaking a law that you created to keep people from breaking the law, but you're breaking the actual law, the actual law that God gave to begin with. And then we go on to verse 5. Listen to how it continues here. But you say, but you say. Folks, now Jesus is going to point out what they've done. He's going to make it clear to them. He's going to point out what they've done, and what they've done is they've taken theology, good theology, and they've twisted it to empower themselves to do the very opposite of what God commanded. Remember, these people are all about the commands, and they're not much about the commander at all. But they forgot all about the intention of the law. They forgot about the original intent. Instead, they developed a loophole to work around some of the inconvenience that they saw in the law. And then Jesus says this, and this may sound a little confusing, but just hang in there. I'm going to explain it in just a minute. But here's what Jesus says in verse 5. But you say that if a man says to his father and mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift now devoted to God. He is not to honor his father with it. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, let me explain it to you because, folks, this is practical. This was something where the rubber kind of met the road in those days, especially for the elderly in their communities or in their society. So let me explain. Here's what Jesus is saying and what they did. They had this command from God to honor their father and mother, which is cool when you're a child or when you're a teenager. You can handle that. But then they realized this. The Pharisees and others, they say to themselves, now now wait a minute, honor your father and mother, that's going to cost me plenty. As they get older, and I do too, that's going to cost me a lot of money. Now remember, in those days, there was no such thing as social security. Your family was your social security. And so what these Pharisees were doing was basically cutting their parents out. They were cutting their parents out. And, and, And so they taught this. Moses didn't say that, you know, at a, that uh, uh, until you're a certain age or your parents are a certain age that you have to honor your parents. That's not indefinite. That's what they were teaching. And so they're like, oh, we want to keep the command of God, but we don't want to spend all our money on our aging parents. Some of our parents just live on and on and on. And guess who they live with? Them. That's who they live with. And so they came up with a great idea. There was another law that they put into place where they could twist this law to their own advantage. And it was a law that said that everything they had financially and so forth, that they had to dedicate to God. And so when their aging parents needed someone to help with the rent, they would say something like this, Oh, Dad, Dad, I I, I love you and and I'd love to help you out. But I've dedicated everything to God, and so to help you out, I'd I'd be robbing God. I'd be robbing God. But folks, they shouldn't have brought this up to Jesus. They shouldn't have done that. They were thinking things like this, oh, 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 Mom, I would love to upgrade where you're living, your your place of residence, but I just can't really afford to because I've, I've dedicated everything to God. And I'd be robbing God if I gave some of this money to you. I need to hold on to what I have just in case God needs it. You talk about a loophole. These guys were masters at it. They actually manufactured a rule that would enable them to not support or honor their parents as God's word commands that we do. Well, here's what Jesus said. 
He says in verse 6, the second part, thus you nullify the word of God. You nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. But folks, before we get all high and mighty uh, about the Pharisees, let me tell you, we all do this. We all do this to a certain extent. We nullify. In other words, we take what's unclear, we'll grab that, let's just use what's unclear, then we can make it mean whatever we want. Or we take the clear and we kind of fog it up so people don't know what the truth really means. We prefer to lean on statements like, well, I think it might mean, you know, or or, or if we just look at this the right way, or we just ignore what's in plain sight. That's what we like to do. And I dare say we've all at one time or another taken what God said and twisted it to our own advantage. So what does Jesus think about this kind of behavior, though? What does he think about what the Pharisees had done? I'm glad you asked because here's exactly what he says in verse 7. He says this, You hypocrites! You hypocrites! Wow, that was fun to say. That was fun to say. Would you say it with me? Would you quote this scripture with me? Verse 7, on three, one, two, three, you hypocrites. Folks, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line, the moral of this story. Jesus doesn't like it when we use God's word to avoid doing God's will. Jesus doesn't like it when we use God's word to avoid doing God's will. That's the bottom line. He doesn't like it when we use his word to find loopholes around doing his Father's will. That doesn't set well with Jesus. The truth is, though, Christians do it all the time. We hang around others who act like this, who love this, who come to expect this behavior, viewing the world through the lens of a twisted law and a twisted way of looking at Scripture. It's kind of like those who pick and choose their sins. Whatever they're fond of, whatever they like to do, well, that's not really a sin anymore. Whatever they feel like speaking the truth about with no grace, however, oh, that they're all over. Those are the sins that count. And pretty soon we forget, folks, that all sin is equally offensive to God. But we like to pick and choose, don't we? We like to pick and choose. We love to find loopholes. And so Jesus shows up. He shows up in a world very much like ours, but somewhat worse. And he did a brilliant thing. He pushed back on their beliefs on what they were doing with the word of God, and he said this. He said, look, forget the commands. Forget the commands. He says, I want to talk about the intent of the commander. I want to talk about the intent of the one who laid down this law. Forget the details for just a moment. I want to return to what God had in mind when he first gave Moses the commandments. And he pushes way back. And he says this, let's start all over. I think we need to start all over. And he says to those who are his followers, those who are his disciples, and this is John chapter 13, he says this. He says, a new command I give you. A new command I give you. Love one another. This is the beginning. This is at the top of the list. I know we're all busy, but this is the one we need to pay attention to. This is how everyone's going to know that you're my disciples, my real followers. And you need to love the way Jesus loved. Remember? Grace and truth. And folks, after Jesus said that, and they started to live this, it caught on. Even the Apostle Paul gets in on the act. He expanded on it when he said this in his letter to the church at Rome, to the Christians at Rome. He said, let no debt remain outstanding. In other words, pay your bills. 
Accept the continuing debt. This one you never pay off. The continuing debt to love one another. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying this. He's saying, hey, Jesus followers. He said, I want you to wake up every day understanding that you're in debt to the people around you. You owe it to them to love them. You owe it to them because of the debt you owe your heavenly Father for loving you so much. And it begins with verse 9. The commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not uh, covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are all summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the rest of Scripture, folks, it's simply commentary on what it means when you decide to love one another. Folks, disciples don't look for loopholes. That's what Christians do. Disciples ask this question, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? Disciples don't open up God's word to see how little they can do. They don't go, hey, honey, the Bible says you're supposed to submit to me. Nah, 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 nah. They don't do that. Disciples don't say, honey, you're supposed to love me just as Christ loved the church, and you're not doing very good at that. Nah, 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 nah. Instead, every day, a disciple wakes up and asks this question. What does love require of me today? What if you tried that for a week? What if we decided to actually do what love requires of us? What if before we sent that email, before we said, honey, come here, or son, sit down, or dad, I don't want to, we actually ask the question, what does love require of me? So folks, what does love require of us? Well, in two weeks, on Labor Day weekend, I'm going to tell you, specifically, it's going to be awful. I'm telling you that right now. It's going to be awful, and it's also going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. But for this week, let's all live with this question and make sure you ask yourself this question every day. What does love require of me? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for not looking for a loophole when it came to your love for us. You had plenty, and unfortunately, we'll probably give you plenty more. Thank you that while we're still sinners, you sent your son to die for the ungodly, us. And I pray today that you'll capture our hearts and our souls, and that we would learn to live love out, the very love you've graciously shown us every single day of the week. Show us what love requires of us each and every day. We pray all this today in Jesus' name. Amen.